Good afternoon. My name is Yihang Yang, and I'm speaking to you from New York City. Welcome to the 18th International Forte Piano Salon. As usual, friends, thank you for joining us from around the world as aficionados, practitioners, and devotees of early pianos. We ask that in your YouTube and Facebook comments box, you say hello now and tell us who you are and from where you're watching because we're so happy to connect with you. For those of you who have been with us for uh, since this is now our third season, uh, the International Forte Piano Salon started during the COVID pandemic as a way for Forte pianists and early keyboard music lovers to connect. And this continues to happen. So we're so thrilled to have you today. Maria Rose cannot join us, but today I also want to welcome our new host, Patricia Garcia Gill, who will be joining our team here at the International Forte Piano Salon. Hello, Patricia, how are you? Hello, Jihen, I'm very good, thank you. I'm very, very happy to be joining, very honored as well. And I wanna take advantage for thanking you and Maria for, and of course, all the team behind the scenes for, um, you know, just trusting me in this very important initiative that I met, um, I discovered about from the very beginning. And I've already participated in like different capacities. So I'm very, very, very happy to be, um, you know, able to help in, in this pursuit. Thank you so much, Patricia. Um, we're just thrilled to have you. And for those of you uh, who've watched pre previous salons, Patricia has been, a uh, wonderful presenter, and she's a very talented young forte pianist who's about to finish her doctorate at the University of North Carolina in Greensboro under the mentorship of Andrew Willis, who is also one of our favorite salon guests and colleagues in the early piano world. So hello, Andrew, I hope you're watching. Um, so welcome, Patricia. Patricia is also an Early Music America emerging artist. She has recently published articles on Latin American and Spanish keyboard music um, and is up to so many interesting projects that uh, she's become a very vital and interesting voice. Um, so one of the missions, of course, of International Forte Piano Salon is to promote many, especially younger voices uh, coming up out of conservatories, the next generation who want to uh, uh, increase the excellence and in diversity of, of what we're doing here with early piano. So uh, Patricia, we're so thrilled to have you today. And we will be featuring today some of Patricia's work and research in our salon theme, which is dancing the minuet to the forte piano. So again, welcome to our beloved audience. Thank you so much for the Catskill Mountain Foundation's continued support. And Patricia, I'll let you introduce the wonderful Julia Bankson, who is from the New York Baroque Dance Company. And you guys have a wonderful episode in store for us today. Thank you so much. Thank you, Yikan. So yes, I'm very, very thrilled to welcome a good friend of mine and a great dancer, uh, Julia Benson, who, as Yikan said, works at the New York Baroque Dance Company under the direction of Catherine Turosi, who I want to thank as well for letting us use some of um, her company's videos that are great and we hope you will enjoy. Uh, Julia and I will be introducing our exploration about the connection between dance and music, which is really strong and important and inherent, and specifically with the forte piano. But first, Julia will tell us a little bit about the minuet as a dance and it, its importance um, in the history of music. Hello, Julia. Hi, thank you so much for having me. I'm thrilled to be joining you. Uh, I'm calling in from White Plains, New York today. And um, I want to remind the audience in case you, and also in case you haven't heard, we have a short workshop on the minuet just following our presentation today. And so we hope that you will keep an eye out for the link in the chat. And when it appears at the end of the presentation, join us there and we'll be so happy to connect with you and move together. Um, and 
first, I'm very excited to be sharing some of what Patricia and I have been working on. Um, so our presentation, Dancing the Minuet to the Fortepiano. Um, first, I just want to say that uh, music and dance connect people with their inner selves as well as with other individuals, as both art forms express cultural identity. And by exploring the minuet, which was a musical and dance genre that spread internationally, we intend to experience how music and dance are inherently connected. Um, and so what makes the minuet so interesting is how it was so popular and it spread from France throughout Europe and the Americas, as we can see in this slide, George Washington. Uh, it was also danced for so long from the 1660s and even into the 1800s by people throughout society. Uh, so it was the Macarena for a hundred years, imagine that. And it stayed on as a musical movement even after it stopped being danced. Um, we're going to watch a video of what a simple couples minuet can look like. Uh, this was performed by the New York Broke Dance Company, featuring the dancers Glenda Norcross and Brent Bainteman, choreographed by Catherine Tarosi. Uh, this is from a concert with Dallas Bach Society. <laughs> Yeah, I, I like this minuet a lot. Um, to me, as you can see in this video also, the minuet is grace personified. And even a simple minuet like this one feels very delicate and can be quite intricate because of its bass step with its ups and downs. Uh, perhaps some of you are familiar with it. You've taken a workshop or uh, seen it uh, taught. The fact that the bass step always starts on the right foot feels artificial rather than natural to a dancer and different dancing masters then just as now recommend different timings and version of that minuet step uh, but it always consists of four changes of weight that fit into two bars of three four meters so that is six beats per minuet bass step and the French dancing master Rameau liked this version. I will get up and show it right now. Um, and you'll see me on the small screen for now. Um, but so the timing that he recommends is this one. We have one, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. I'll show it one more time. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Yeah. So he divided the minuet bar, the six beats, into three equal parts. Uh, and compared to other dances in three, four meter, for example, the courant, the minuet is full of moments of suspension while the courant flows closer to the ground. The pasakai contain high impact steps, such as the pas de pasakai on one leg. The saraband is slower, gliding, and typically travel less. Although there are solo minuets, the minuet is typically danced with a partner, like you just saw, and also in this picture. Uh, the most common figures of the minuet 
offers a more intimate connection than some of the more forward-facing dances. There are also group minuets. And when rehearsing these group minuets with the New York Baroque Dance Company, it really becomes a teamwork exercise of breathing, breathing and leaning together. Uh, so we're going to watch another video. This is from the same performance by the New York Baroque Dance Company uh, with Dallas Bach Society accompanying. Featuring dancers in this video will be Caroline Copeland and Roberto Lara. It's choreographed by Catherine Terosi, and you will see me as a bacant dancing with Matthew Ting in the group minuet in the second part.
So these characteristics that were mentioned by Julia before were very appreciated in the 18th century. In fact, the Baroque minuet contained all the musical attributes that would make it remain as the most popular dance form, whether to be danced or not, throughout the 18th century. A scene, character, a simple texture, and regular clearly de delineated phrases. It represented all the gallant values by being graceful and charming and providing great pleasure and agreeable entertainment. The melodic and harmonic patterns of the eight-bar menuet had become so standardized already and predictable by the mid-century that compositional games were made out of them. Kernberger, notably, created tables of individual minuet measures in 1757, assembled in such a way that eight throws of a dice would yield an eight-bar phrase cadencing on the dominant, and another eight throws, a concluding return to the tonic. Matheson, one of the first the theorists who used the term galant to describe the style of music that spread from Naples at the beginning of the century, as opposed to the learned style, recommended the minuet because it was easy to feel. Schultz described in 1774 the minuet as an aid to learn how to feel phrase divisions. Koch, in his method of composition on the volume published in 1793, described the minuet as the one, quote, which above all dance melodies is taken up most often in our modern compositions, end quote. Koch, also made an interesting clarification that implies that it was still dance at the time. And I quote, if it is arranged for dancing, then its melodic sections must, must have a rhythmical relation of an even number of measures. And it must consist of two sections of reprises, each containing no more than eight measures, end quote. Joseph Ripoll detailed the exact characteristics of a correct minuet and established the form as the first one to start learning the art of compositions from. Yeah, and as a dancer, I too consider the minuet to be a form rather than one specific choreography. We have a base step and then lots of variations. But why, Patricia, is it important for a musician to look at the dance? Well, let's remind ourselves that 18th century musicians were acquainted with the language of the time, and they knew how to read and interpret the score accordingly. The character of a piece was given by the metric, frequent rhythms, and the mel melody structure that would inform the performer's choices on tempo, articulation, or dynamics. But for instance, Mapurk and Kerberger, who were students of Bach, recommended individuating the basic dance rhythms to recognize the type of composition. And this is after 1750s. So, I mean, considering the choreography or the dance steps was still required for the performers to understand the kind of music that they were going to perform. Um, in a great contemporary res resource that we have referred to during our exploration, the book, The Dance and the Music of J.S. Bach, the authors Lidl and Jen suggest a way of approaching the issue of deciding the tempo for a musical composition, because of course there, there were no metro marks. <laughs> so they suggest considering the potential choreography. In any case, trying it with a dancer, and I hope it's the same for you, Julia, uh, it is the most revealing and a straightforward path to understand how to properly read the menuet score. So I wonder, could you explain us how do these parameters that a musician could look at translate into steps? Absolutely. So we have typed up here, as you can see, uh, the metric is the minuet dance base step. Uh, and then the metric and the rhythm are closely related, of course, in dance. Uh, but rhythm also has to do with what the German dancing master Taubert calls the cadence. And this is the rhythmic pattern, but it's also the character of the dance. So we've talked a little bit about that previously, pleasing character. 
Uh, then we have the melody structure. Uh, and the choreography does typically correspond to the melody and the AB music structure, uh, but the steps do, don't typically repeat when the music repeats. And this is actually true for Baroque dances in general. Um, and then, of course, if we have the choreography, that will be very helpful in dictating the tempo that a music piece is played in. Uh, some of the steps are especially sensitive, like jumps, balances, and also various kinds of ornaments. Uh, so we will look a little bit about uh, on the music uh, structure of this dance here. It's the minuet performed by Mrs. Santlow uh, from England. And you can see here we've got an A at the top. You see the music. This is the dance notation that I use for reconstructing dances from this period. And you can see this is a minuet. Um, it starts at the bottom of the page. And Patricia, could you maybe trace? Can we see your cursor? Uh, I don't think you're able to. I'm so sorry. That's, no, that's fine. Um, we start, uh, you can follow me along then. So we start at the bottom of the page. You can see the starting sign there for a woman. Uh, and she starts off the first A by going in a circle. Uh, and you see small markings uh, after each uh, four steps, the minuet bass steps, and that corresponds to the measures at the top of the page, the music measures. So we have um, eight of those and in the first A, and then it repeats, right? But as you can see, the dance does not repeat. It goes off in a completely different direction. And so this is just an example of how uh, the dance, it's not a plain repeat of the same steps. It does something different typically. Um, yeah. Yeah, just to clarify. So when we have the, the B would be when we start seeing that kind of triangle, right? Uh, the second the second A uh, is when uh, oh, yeah, we have completed the first circle and then you take a step to the right. That's what that straight line to the uh, right indicates. Uh, so you uh, it's a step that we will try out together later, but uh, that uh, is the first, that marks the, fir the first measure of the new A. Yes. Um, yeah, and you will see, in fact, uh, you will not just see this dance on paper, but you will see it uh, on video very soon, uh, because in this following video, we demonstrate how the wrong tempo does not allow the dancer to perform the given choreography for this minuet, uh, not to mention that it clearly does not work musically. And this very first, uh, this very slow first version of the minuet will be followed by a more realistic tempo, which works better both musically and from my perspective.
So as you can see, sometimes it is necessary to use trial and error when figuring out the tempo. Uh, and dancers often rehearse for weeks before performances. Uh, and often the musicians are elsewhere. And so we have to use a recording as uh, as you might know, uh, when performing this repertoire, sometimes there are no recordings commercially available, or they might not be what you wish for. And so in or order for us all to learn more too, it, of course, it's better to get together in person and to ask questions. Uh, now you're going to see a video of me performing this Santlo Minuet again. Uh, just This was just last week. Um, at uh, Midtown Concerts presented by Gotham Early Music Scene here in New York. Uh, you'll see it in Baroque costume and it will. Uh, I will be accompanied by Paul Shipper, Jason Preset, and Dong Myung Ahn. Yeah, so as a choreographer, I have learned a tremendous amount from reconstructing these dances from notation uh, and from seeing how Baroque choreographers translated their music into movement. To me, it seems like they view the dancer as another musician in the ensemble, always in conversation with the others, sometimes emphasizing and sometimes complimenting. And in this collaboration with Patricia, I wanted to explore more possibilities of how dance ornamentation can be, and also uh, the ornamentation that feels highly musical. Uh, and in our project, I've been studying the complete dancing master from 1717 by the German dancing master Gottfried Taubert. His treatise is fascinating for many reasons, but uh, especially for his very concrete suggestions of steps to use as ornamentation in the minuet. Uh, his book was 1,200 pages long and includes tables of no less than 700 Baroque steps. He says that you may use any of these in a minuet, and that is a fascinating find for a Baroque dancer. 
Uh, instead of using all of these steps, however, that Howard talks about, uh, in our project, I limited myself to only using the variations used in the Minuet for Mrs. Santlow. Uh, and there is still a lot of variation available there. Uh, and combining our individual knowledge, we came up with uh, this beginning of a choreography to Mariana Martinez music, uh, which wasn't originally choreographed as far as we know. Yeah, so um, by the way, um, I'm sorry, these are the ornamentation possibilities. That's right. You can and, see. and this, I, I just wanted to, to mention that the fact that when the music repeats, the dancer doesn't um, repeat the same steps. It's very revealing as well for musicians because, uh, you know, the question of ornamenting or not ornamenting, I think it's clearly uh, answered here because if the dancer is not repeating and the dancer has all these many possibilities to to apply variations, I think the performer should too. And of course, the treatises from the time, um, especially from the 18th century that I know a little better, they definitely mentioned that, yes, it's a possibility and it's wanted. So, yeah, but going back to Martinez, um, it is uh, interesting, it's been very interesting to consider the possibility of uh, instrumental music to be danced, especially if the composer is offering a hint in the title, such as this one, Tempo Diminuetto. So this is the third movement of Mariana Martinez Sonata in A major. And probably many of you know by now, also because I keep talking about this, my favorite composer, <laughs> that Mariana Martinez was a very influential figure in the 18th century. Uh, she was born in Vienna from Italian Spanish origins, and she was the protege of Metastasio, the most famous uh, poet and librettist of the 18th century. And she hosted a salon uh, like this one. And that salon became one of the most important cultural centers in Vienna in the late 18th century that, you know, celebrities like Mozart visited. And he was actually reported to play uh, duets with her on the pianoforte. So uh, in any case, we don't know if they would dance in the salons or if she would dance or if she would dance her music. But it is definitely interesting to consider the possibility. Uh, in this particular project that I um, took on with Julia, it was revealing particularly the fact that we both came up with the same question uh, separately. And we were wondering how these extra measures that we've marked on the score that you're seeing on the screen would affect the music and the dancing. But let's watch it being performed, maybe two times if that is possible, and see if you can appreciate this break in the usual structure of a minuet. <laughs> Yeah, so I too felt that shift of the downbeat from going from 
a six beat measure to a three, like a third. So I, I did some flourishes extra there. And it's fun for me to see how Martinez plays with this dance form following the convention for the most part, but also adds to it. Yeah, definitely. And again, although this Viennese minuet wasn't traditionally danced, as far as, as we know, it is obviously possible to play it in a way that makes it danceable. Also, you might have realized about the difference in, t in my tempo uh, between the video, uh, excuse me, the audio that you heard at the beginning of the program that was recorded on my own before starting this project and the one that I used for you know, letting Julia dance it. So, and this is just the beginning. We have um, started this collaboration with a dance scholar in Paris, who is an expert on early uh, 19th century dance and the late minuet. And we are very excited to continue our exploration. And I have one last video to show you what a similar music dance collaboration can look like. Uh, Catherine Tarosi's choreography for Bach Cello Suites. Dancing in this excerpt are New York Baroque Dance Company dancers Maggie Sweeney Smith and Alexis Silver. Uh, they are accompanied by cellist Sydney Zamalan from Dallas Bach Society. Yeah, very nice. Thank you for that. So um, we want to encourage you all to explore the possibilities of collaborating with a dancer for you instrumentalists uh, and for the pianist or keyboardist. Uh, and then we also encourage you to move to Zoom <laughs> to experience yourself uh, the minuet. Before we move on to Zoom, if you have any questions that you would like to ask us now, we can also reply them here. Um, but there will be also time at the end of the Zoom call. And so, yeah, again, both options are great. You can type them now on the chat box or we can also talk at the very end. Thank you so much. Sorry, I was on mute. Thank you so much, Patricia and Julia. That was really inspiring to see just the level of excellence that you both brought to looking at the minuet. <laughs> um, as someone with two left feet, <laughs> uh, I'm still inspired to 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 look look at um, this dance more closely as a musician. In fact, Julia, this past week in my improvisation classes at Juilliard, um, we've been trying to improvise sarabans and minuets looking at sources based on this book by little and jenny called dance and the music of j.s bach but it, it's no comparison to seeing someone like you put this into practice uh, with your colleagues so um yeah let's see oh good we have a question from ann goodwin i believe from canada when was the latest minuet composed and by whom Hmm. When was the latest minuet composed and by whom? 
This is a good question. Well, Anne, I guess my, my students and I were just improvising minuets in our class. So you could say that the minuet has never died as a musical form because it's it's so timeless and 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 easy to to put together musically as um but you know the, i i'll i'll briefly answer the question patricia and julia please feel free to uh you know ravel has written minuet wrote minuets as early as in the 20th century it's it's a form that has been used throughout different styles it's never really died out um anything to add there no, I totally agree with you, Yixin. I was going to say the same thing. The, the question is maybe also when it stopped to be dance, um, which is hard to say <laughs> because there's no, like, you know, they maybe not everything is reported as we do now, <laughs> probably. But um, but I think, it, it, I don't know, my idea, and this would be something to really research more in depth, but I think my idea is that, you know, in these balls, in even like in the 19th century, I can imagine people dancing and why not? I mean, anyway, if it was a dance that it was so like, it's, it, I don't want to say easy in a way that a professional dancer can dance it, but um, a dance that is a social one and can be used as entertainment. So it, it is a great question because of course, um, there's, there's also the question of when does the minuet stop being the minuet and become something else? Because, of course, over a hundred years, the form changes a lot, right? So if we look at a Lully minuet from an opera in the late 1600s, that is very different from the dances in, in the music in minuet form that Martinez was writing, for example. And so, of course, the dance changed as well. And uh, we have uh, one of the problems that we have uh, that, that I've had is that there's a lack of sources um, in in um, Feuille annotation, the notation that you saw earlier, because it, it becomes uh, quite clear what what the steps are by using that. If you read the annotation, it, it's quite easy uh, to decipher, <laughs> believe it or not. Um, but then after the 1750s, it's not really used anymore. And uh, one might ask themselves why, because it's a very convenient system in many ways, but the dancing changed too, of course. So it wasn't filling the function that it had served before. And so, uh, we have some minuets from the, I believe it's the 1770s, uh, that are notated in Feuille annotation. So we can see there a little bit how things have changed. It's uh, Malkiet's treatise. Uh, but then after that, there's really not a lot. And also, um, we don't know what's happening. You know, the minuet was danced so vastly in so many different countries. So just because it was, it stopped being, they stopped publishing dance notations in Paris doesn't mean that it wasn't still danced in Mexico. Like we found a, a big collection um, that was from the 1750s, right, Patricia? Uh, of the same, in, some of the same minuets that were danced in Paris around uh, 1700. So 50 years later, these were still being printed in Mexico. And uh, so, so it, it's hard to say where, when they stopped being danced. Um, there were particular, particularly popular minuets, also particular dances that were super popular. Uh, Minuet de la Cour, for example, that was we know was performed into the 1800s and, and beyond that, I think 1825, we know for sure that it was still uh, danced. So it's really interesting, uh, great question. And just relating to your uh, to what you mentioned about the Mexican uh, collection, the notation in this case was very different, right? Like it was just uh, not steps as you saw, but just words and some like uh, abbreviations of the words that we had a hard time translating, even though they were written in Spanish because uh, it was old Spanish. And also, like as I said, some kind of symbols as well that they you know, we're acquainted with, but we are not anymore, so. Mm. Yeah, those were specifically about the social uh, minuet, the group minuet. Uh, so that was, um, uh, yeah, uh, really interesting to look at. <laughs> you can learn a lot. 
Okay. Um, I think we should probably move to the Zoom. Um, so again, to our wonderful audience, this was um, Patricia Garcia Gill, our new host of the International Forte Piano Salon in her collaboration with Julia Bankston, wonderful Baroque dancer. Thank you to you both for this super informative presentation on the minuet. And now we're gonna have an interactive workshop where you can dance in the comfort of your own living room as you're watching on Zoom. And Julia and Patricia will lead us in some basic instructions and how to dance. Uh, so again, the Zoom is the Zoom link is in the comments box of their Facebook YouTube live stream, or it's on the International Forte Piano Salon website. Uh, so, so please feel free to join us right now for our Zoom portion. Thank you again for joining us. Our next salon will be March 24th, featuring Hilda Huang, who is a wonderful forte pianist currently studying in Holland. Thanks again. Bye.